<clears throat> so we started off here in 2 Thessalonians chapter 3. There's a, a few things I want to point out to you here. Um, and I'll get into what the whole sermon's about. But we see, we know, of course, the, the epistle of 2 Thessalonians is, is the Apostle Paul's writing it to the church in Thessalonica. And what we see here, Paul is obviously a spiritual leader. He's an apostle. He's someone who has written many epistles to the churches, and he's giving them instructions to follow. Right? We notice, I think, at least three times just in this chapter alone, and he's like, I commanded you this. I commanded you this. I commanded you this. Paul's in a position where he's saying, look, I'm commanding you to do this stuff. And, of course, he has the power of the Holy Ghost, and he's, he's writing literally God's Word under these churches. And what I'm going to be teaching about this morning is the subject of leadership and being a good leader and some, some aspects of leadership that will help you to become a better leader. And there are, we're going to go through the, the principles first. And, you know, this isn't completely exhaustive on leadership. I know there's lots of qualities and lots of things we can go into. I just have a few points that we're going to look at this morning on leadership. And then we're going to go into some applications of the leadership. Now, obviously men are going to be in many more positions of leadership than women, but there are positions that women have that are leadership roles also. So the leadership roles we're going to be applying later on, and you can keep this in mind, we're going to be talking about soul winning, because soul winning takes some leadership, even just individual, because you're going to be leading someone else to Christ, right? You're leading them. You're guiding them. Being a soul winner that can teach others soul winning, also requires leadership, and that's men and women. And then husbands and wives have their own leadership roles within the family. So we're going to be going into those specifically later on. But first, we're going to cover some of these principles. You don't have to turn there, but in 1 Corinthians 11, chapter 1, Apostle Paul writes, Be ye followers of me, even as I also am of Christ. Now I praise you, brethren, that you remember me in all things and keep the ordinances as I delivered them to you. As I mentioned at the beginning of the sermon, the Apostle Paul was a leader, and he's trying to exhort these people, saying, look, follow me the same way that I'm following Christ. And a lot of people these days say, oh, I don't need some man to tell me what the Bible is. I don't need some man to tell me this and that. They don't, I don't need to go to church because some man. Look, the Apostle Paul himself is saying, look, be a follower of me. He goes, oh, I don't follow some man. Look, you shouldn't follow some man that's contrary to Christ. Amen. You know, I, I believe that. If someone is not doing what Christ has and not teaching God's ways, yeah, don't follow that man. You don't need to follow that man. But if you have someone, for example, like an Apostle Paul, who, like every other human being, is imperfect, but he's following Christ and he's teaching Christ and he's, and he's walking the walk, he's running the race, and he's doing a good job, hey, follow that man, even as he follows Christ. Now, when he strays from Christ, don't keep following him follow Christ. But we have men. God has given us men to be examples for us, to be in samples. We're going to see that here in 1 Thessalonians chapter 3. Let's start reading here in verse number uh, 6. The Bible says, now we command you, brethren, see another commandment. We say, look, you need to do this. He's taking the leadership role, the role of authority, saying, we command you, brethren, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, See, the, the authority comes from Christ. We're preaching to you in the name of Jesus Christ because he's not here physically as he was before when he was, before he was crucified, right? So the Apostle Paul is saying, Now we command you in the name of Jesus Christ that you withdraw yourselves from every brother that walketh disorderly and not after the traditions which he received of us. For yourselves know how ye ought to follow us. For we behave not ourselves disorderly among you. Say, look, you know that you should be following us and our example because we didn't walk disorderly among you. Separate yourselves from those that are walking disorderly. Don't walk with them. But hey, when we were with you, we were giving you the right example to follow. Follow us. Verse number eight. Neither did we eat any man's bread for naught, but wrought with labor and travail night and day that we might not be chargeable to any of you, not because we have not power, but to make ourselves an example unto you to follow us. So see, we see that word example, it means an example. We've made ourselves an example for you to follow us. And what he's saying here is that, look, we didn't eat anyone else's food for nothing. Basically, we didn't receive just gifts and charity and food for free. Right? When they came into town, they were preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now, they had every right to accept 
you know, payment or food or whatever for doing the work of God and doing what they're doing, to be supported by people, you know, to eat other people's food. But he said, you know what, we didn't do that. And this is kind of a indicative of the Apostle Paul. Because he was leading his life by example. And this is the first point that I want to get across with leadership is you have to lead by example. If you want to be a good leader, you have to be the example. You know, I mentioned this in a sermon a week or two ago. It used to be where in warfare, you would have the general, you would have the person in charge of the army that was leading the battle, right? He was the first one making the charge and, and going into the fight, literally getting his hands dirty and fighting. These days we have, you know, an executive branch, which is supposed to be the leader of like the whole United States forces, right? George Washington led the people in the battle. Other presidents in this country even have, have led their people into battle because they were being a leader and they were following by examples. They're not, they're not going to send people off to do something that they themselves won't do. These days we've got a whole screwed up attitude about it. Oh, you have this, this super important person. We can't have him going. I mean, King David, he went in and fought his battles, Right? It wasn't just Joab. I mean, there was, and the one time that David didn't go in to fight, what did he do? He gets into sin. He gets himself into adultery with Bathsheba when he should have been out there fighting the fight. But now we get people that are lifted up and they think that, oh, I'm way more, I'm way too important to do those things. No, if you want to be a good leader, for, don't have that attitude. Nobody wants to follow that guy, the guy that thinks he's too good to do any of the work. I don't care. You know, you see this in business a lot. It doesn't matter what the field is, but you get someone who's, who's a boss, you know, and they think that they're so important and I'm not going to lower myself to do those types of things. No one wants to follow that guy. You can't even relate to someone like that if you are working for someone above you. You know, like, wh who do you think you are? Because we know, you know, people know you're nothing special. You're just another man. I mean, yeah, you're in a position. Maybe you work real hard. Great. But why don't you, if you want to be a good leader and you want people to actually follow you, and to, and to have respect for you and listen to what you have to say, you need to lead by example. You have to. <clears throat> so what the Apostle Paul was saying here is that we wrought with labor and travail night and day. He said we worked. Night and day we worked so that we couldn't be chargeable unto you. We paid our own way. We're foreigners, we're visitors, we're coming in from another place, but yet we still worked in order to support ourselves so that we can show you that you can serve God, you can preach the gospel, you can do what's right, and you can work at the same time and support yourself and not have to rely on anybody else. And he was teaching them how to be diligent and hard workers. See, unfortunately, we have a lot of people who say, I don't have time to go soul winning. I don't have time to serve God because I've got all this other work to do. You can be a hard worker and pay your own way and not have to rely on support for other people and still do the work of God. I got an email this week from someone and it's, it's kind of sad. I'm disappointed. You know, I don't know this person personally, but I get uh, emails oftentimes from a lot of missionaries and people that, um, you know, we'll, we'll get on their, their mail newsletters get updates on things that are going on. And, um, you know, we're so small, we, we're not really able to support very, like we have one person we send money to, but it can't, we can't even pledge to send anything because we don't have a, a steady, uh, you know, money supply to coming in to be able to, to say, yeah, we're going to definitely be able to support you in this matter. So, but we still like to, I still like to follow up on people and especially if I think someone's doing a good job or, or, or you know, they believe right, they look like a good worker or whatever. I don't know this man personally, but I just read um, what probably would be the last letter, and he's been on deputation for a little while, where he goes out and, and tries to get the support of, of churches so that he can be a full-time pastor. And look, I'm all for full-time pastors. I think it's completely right for a church to support a pastor and a pastor to get paid because he's doing the work of God. I have no problems with any of that. I'm not like these house church movement people that, that don't think the pastor should be paid and they call him a hireling and they try to, you know, denigrate him and, and just put down the position of the pastor and, and not even use the biblical model that says that it's right uh, for a pastor to be able to get paid. But, um, you know, I'm not going to get into all that. But what was kind of sad about it is, is that 
you know, and a lot of times people say, they get almost a little charismatic with their, you know, I asked God about this, and it's like, God told me this. And it, you know, it's like, God didn't, did he really tell you that? You know, I get we have the Holy Spirit that could lead us into all truth and wisdom, but the Bible is still the same. It doesn't really change for an individual. I still think it's God wants him to do this work, but he was saying, oh, I, don't, you know, I think God's closed the doors to do this. And basically what it amounted to is that he didn't get very much support at all. And he wanted to do, um, start a church here in the U.S. And it, when, you know, when I first heard about this, I started getting through, I'm like, that's awesome. Yeah, that's great. You know, a missionary that's trying to set up churches in the U.S., you know, people get so focused on other countries and hey, they need the gospel too. But people get so focused and want to help out these other countries. Hey, we, need, we need churches right here in the United States. And the area they was going to is a, is a big area and it has a big need. And what seems disappointing to me, and look, I, you know, I don't know all this. That's why I'm not mentioning my name or anything like that. I want to identify this person. I don't know the whole story, right? I don't know every, all the details and everything else. But it appears, and if this is the case, then I think it's wrong. What it appears to me is that he's not going to do it because he's not raised support. Because there doesn't seem to be anyone supporting him. Look, if you feel that there's a need to, to fill in a certain area and you're qualified and you want to be a pastor, hey, and, and your church is going to send you out, go get sent out and start the church. Why can't you work? Especially in the United States. Now, if it's in a foreign field, I could still see sometimes where you're going to need support because trying to get a job to be able to support your family and do the work of the ministry may be a lot more difficult for a foreigner. Right? For someone that's coming from the United States to a whole other country, I get that. But if you're going to do the work here, why can't you get a job? A full-time job and do the... I mean, what do you think I'm doing right now? This is how we started the church. Now, the goal, yes, is to be where I can be fully supported by the church and invest all of my time serving God in the church. But until that time comes, I mean, the church needs to grow. See, I don't want to be supported by other people just to do the full-time job here. I don't want to rely on other people to pay my way through from other churches, you know, and then have them not like what I'm preaching. And now all of a sudden I'm in a predicament because I started doing this. I've been relying on this money. I'm preaching a certain way. These people don't like it. They're going to yank their support from me because they don't like what I'm saying. And now I'm stuck in a position as opposed to just being supported locally, right? And when you're supported locally by your own church and you don't have to worry about what the other people, you can preach the way that you're preaching, the way that you're preaching. The people that don't like it are going to leave anyways, but you're not going to be relying on, on them to support you. You're going to be relying on people who already know what you believe and teach and preach. So you don't have to worry about, you know, censoring the message because you have to feed your family. And this is, and obviously that would be wrong no matter what, no matter where the money's coming from. But it's a lot easier to do that and a lot more tempting when, when the money's coming from somewhere else where people don't really hear you on a regular basis and all of a sudden they want to yank their money. And, and it's just, I don't believe it's a good situation to put yourself in to begin with. So the whole deputation process to get in a church in the United States, I don't think that's right. But, um, you know, the Apostle Paul wasn't like that. He was someone who says, you know what, follow us. We're giving you an example. This is how you work hard. This is how you can work a job and you can serve God at the same time. It's an example. Now turn, if you would, to Matthew chapter 23. Matthew 23. Another reason to lead by example is because you're giving someone, you know, when, when you say something, you could, in your head, just kind of agree with it, but it's not always real. You know what I mean? When you, when you see somebody doing something, it makes a much bigger impact and will stay with you longer than someone telling you to do something. It'd be, it's kind of like this. Um, you know, Brother Jerry's a plumber. If he were just to go to a classroom... And they could have pictures and diagrams and you could learn about plumbing from the textbook. It's going to be a lot harder to go out onto the field and then start doing it just, just by having been told, right? Well, this is what you do. 
But when you have somebody there that's leading you by example and you see what they're doing, that's going to stay with you a lot longer. That's why I believe, you know, apprenticeship is much better in, in just about every field than just going to college and getting a degree and just going to school and thinking, well, now I'm going to go out and get a any job you get, you're going to have to go through some training. You're going to have to go and figure out, hey, this is what you actually need to do here. You know, you can get some good information and knowledge from, you know, from textbooks or from school or whatever. You know, you can, you can get valuable knowledge, some technical knowledge, but you're not going to get nearly as much from that as you will from hands-on, as you're going to get from somebody leading you and training you and teaching you by doing. And you can say, this is how you do this. Oh, here's a situation. This is how we do it. Right? And they're leading you by example. Matthew 23, it's also important to, if you're going to be a good leader and you want people to, to follow, because the whole point of leadership is to have people follow you, right? I mean, that's the whole point. That's what we, uh, if you don't have anyone following you, you're not a leader. You're leading nobody. You could be leading yourself. Matthew 23, we see Jesus, and he, he, this is the chapter where he really rails on the Pharisees. Now, the Pharisees were supposed to be the spiritual leaders of that time. Right? They, were, they were holding these positions of authority within the church. They were supposed to be the teachers of doctrine. But look at what Jesus says about them. Verse number one, Then spake Jesus to the multitude and to his disciples, saying, The scribes and the Pharisees sit in Moses' seat. All therefore whatsoever they bid you observe, that observe and do. But do not ye after their works... For they say and do not. And this is what you'll find over and over and over again through the Bible. The biggest problem with the Pharisees are they're hypocrites. They're hypocrites. And he goes on later into this, in this chapter and he rails on them. He says, woe unto you, woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. And he goes on and he lists off all of the things that they're doing that are wrong. And they're just being told hypocrites because they, they put God's word aside and they make up their own laws and their own traditions. And they, they give that more emphasis than God's word. And they become hypocrites. Now, if you want to be a good leader, you can't be a hypocrite. Now, obviously, to some degree, again, people are saying, yeah, but we're all sinners. You know, you can't be perfect. I, I get that. And to some degree, we're all hypocrites. Just like the people at the door say, well, I don't want to go to church because, you know, they're just, it's just full of hypocrites. Well, you know what? To some level, that's true. But to some level, you're a hypocrite too, and everybody's a hypocrite true. So I guess you can't just associate with anybody or listen to anyone because you're just going to say, hey, well, everyone's a hypocrite. There's a big difference between, you know, making a mistake and, and being a sinner because you're human, because sometimes you just fall short. And then you get back up and you keep on trying to do things. There's a big difference between that and someone who's just doesn't care and is intentionally teaching false and, and doesn't care about it at all. And he's, Jesus told him, hey, look, you know what? They're sitting in Moses' seat. They're in that position that Moses held. And when they teach you the Bible, you know, you can listen to them when they, and observe that. But don't look at them for an example. Because they say these things and they don't do them. And the reason why we know this is because they didn't believe it. They don't believe Moses' word. Now, they can teach Moses' law. They can say, oh, yeah, we believe Moses' law. They can say it all day long, but they don't do it. So Jesus said, yeah, when, you know, when they're teaching you the Mosaic law, listen to them. But don't, but don't do after them. Don't look at them and say, oh, well, this is how we do it. Because that's what leader, well, especially a spiritual leader, what you're going to be doing is you're going to be looking at the pastor of the church and saying, oh, okay, he's teaching on leadership this morning. He's teaching on, you know, not doing this thing, not doing that thing. And then you watch him, you know, he's, he's preaching that you shouldn't go out to the movies. And then he goes home and, and throws in the same exact movie that's out at the, at the theater. You know, it's like, that's not a good example. That's not right. Or he's teaching you not to go out to the movies and you see him at the movie, you know, like... <laughs> Just not doing it at all. Just saying it and not doing it whatsoever. That's being a hypocrite. You're in Matthew 23. Flip back to Matthew chapter 7. But you see, when, when you're a hypocrite, no one is going to want to follow you then. And honestly, it, it, personally in my life, this is one of the reasons why I didn't talk about Jesus very much. When I was first saved, not like when I first got saved, I was, I was kind of telling, I was telling a lot of people, I was excited about it, you know, it was a big deal. When I was born again, I'd tell my friends, I told my family, yeah, you know, like, 
Like, I'm saved. I couldn't even explain very much because I was real ignorant. I was, I was just a babe in Christ. But I knew that I was saved. I put my faith in Christ and I knew that I had eternal life. But shortly after that excitement time period, you know, I, I didn't really end up getting plugged into church. And I just kind of continued living the way I'd been living. Now, I knew that, for example, that, the, that it was wrong to get drunk. I didn't even have to know what verse in the Bible it said that. I knew it was wrong. And anyone with half of a brain should be able to know that that's not a good thing. It's not right. I mean, even just the physical effects that you feel afterwards should tell you, hey, maybe this isn't a good thing. Maybe this isn't a good idea. And because I was getting into those types of sins and, and realizing and, and knowing, and see, in that case, I knew that the Bible said that it wasn't right to, to, to be getting drunk. Regardless of whether you think it's right to have a drink here or there. And I think that's wrong, by the way. Anyway, I think, I think it's never right to be drinking alcohol. But at that point, I didn't even know. Right? Because you, know, you hear people saying, well, Jesus turned water into wine and all this other stuff. But I knew it was a sin to get drunk. I knew that much. But I still did it anyways. And I would even, you know, I would, I would be able to say, hey, yeah, getting drunk is a sin, and then I'm going out and doing it. Which makes me a big hypocrite. And for that reason... I held my mouth shut when opportunities came up to actually talk to people about, about Jesus. When I talked to friends in my life or talked to other people, I never brought, I, I stayed away from the subject. Why? Because I didn't want to be a hypocrite. Because, and I knew then, it's common knowledge. Who's going to want to listen to you? You say, oh yeah, oh you believe the Bible? But the Bible says you're not supposed to fornicate. The Bible says you're not supposed to get drunk. The Bible says all this stuff. And you're doing all these stuff. You believe the Bible and now you want me to believe the Bible and you're not even showing that you do any of this stuff? You're not going to be a successful leader if you're just living a life of hypocrisy and you're trying to teach something and say something and lead in a certain way when you are just a total hypocrite. No, one, no one's going to listen to you seriously. The next point I want, so we've already seen, you know, we need to lead by example. And while you're leading by example, you can't be a hypocrite about it. You need to, to maintain your own cause. Because how, how can you expect someone else to do something that you're teaching them, telling them to do, if you can't do it yourself? But when you lead by example, you show them, hey, this can be done. That's going to inspire people to, hey, look, this person's doing it. And I, like, I get so much inspiration from my former pastor, Pastor Anderson, with how much he's been able to do, how much work he's able to do. Wow, well, if he can do it, because you see somebody doing it. You see someone who's not just said, oh, man, the TV's wicked. He threw it out of his house. And you can go over there. It doesn't exist. He's leading by example. He teaches that's wrong, and you need to get rid of it. But he's not just telling you to do it. He's already done it himself. It's already done. Here's someone who's working hard, working a full-time job, working overtime, and still doing all the work for the church. And again, you could look at that and say, oh, well, maybe I'm not as busy as I think I am. When I see someone like this, or in, this, you know, in the Bible, like the Apostle Paul, he's working day and night and still getting all this stuff done. Maybe I need to reevaluate what I'm doing since he's literally doing it. And you can see that. When you lead, another good attribute, lead with confidence and with authority. Matthew 7, uh, verse number 28, the Bible says, And it came to pass when Jesus had ended these sayings, the people were astonished at his doctrine, for he taught them as one having authority and not as the scribes. So you have the scribes and these Pharisees and these teachers and doctors of the law back then. And, you know, they'd have, they'd have people come and listen to him, but nobody got the following that Jesus had. That they got jealous of him. They were just like, what are we going to do about this guy? And that's one of the reasons why they wanted him gone. Because he was just drawing. You know, think about when he fed the 5,000. I mean, he had, he had over 5,000 people. Because that's 5,000 men. There was women and children and stuff too. They're, all, they're following him off into a desert place. Just out of the city. Just out where there's, where there's nothing around. Just to listen to him. 
That's a pretty big crowd. That's a pretty big crowd to draw, to have listened to you and, and to be influenced by you. Why? He taught as one that had authority. Not like the scribes. He had authority. Why did he have authority? Because it's God's word. Because you know and we can be confident that this is the truth. We ha can have the same authority that Jesus had. Because it's not our own. The authority is the word of God. It's God's word. So when you're preaching and teaching God's word, hey, this is all the authority that you need. You don't need your own authority. It's, it's right here. In order to teach with authority, though, in order to be able to do this, you have to know what you're talking about. <laughs> right? You can't teach something authoritatively and say, thus saith the Lord, unless you actually know what the Lord said. <laughs> you, have to, you have to know. You can't say, thus saith the Lord, make up your own stuff. No, if you're going to teach authoritatively, you need to know what you're talking about. You can't claim the authority from the Word of God if you don't even know what the Word of God says. So if you want to be, and this is going to go a little bit in an example of being like a spiritual leader or be able to teach people, because remember the applications, we're going to be applying it to soul winning and stuff. If you want to be able to teach people from the Bible, you yourself have to know the Bible. You have to put in the work and study and know what it says. And if you're going to want to teach and be a good leader, hey, lead in the things that you do know. Nobody knows everything. I'm not going to lead in areas of the Bible that I don't really know about, that I'm kind of unclear about. I, I'm not, there's no way I'm not going to be a good leader in that way because if I don't even know what, who, what am I going to lead people, I'm going to be like the blind leading the blind. But the things that I do know, I can teach that authoritatively from God's Word because it's all here and it's something that... that is clear and, and I already know. So in order to teach others and to lead others, you have to know it yourself. And that is how you'll be able to do it authoritatively. Because when you teach and lead authoritatively, people will listen and they'll follow. And they'll be able to know the difference. You won't have to wonder, am I being authoritative? You know, am I authoritative on this su subject? The people will know. When they hear it, they know. When Jesus taught, they knew. Now, no, we're not going to be a Jesus Christ. But... You can still tell when people are speaking because they know a subject really well. I mean, you hear people talk about stuff, and, and I'm able to pick up on this really good, uh, especially in my own area. When I hear people talking about computers, you know, some people, some people are able to fake it, just like we have false prophets out there, right? They can fake it and, and try to teach authoritatively using their own, their own methods. But I can hear people talk about computers sometimes, and some people, they don't really know what they're talking about at all. At all. Like, I mean, and they're not speaking like they know everything, right? They're not speaking authoritatively. It's pretty easy for that to, to, to get that impression from people. Other people will try to speak authoritatively, and they still, it's clear they don't know what they're talking about because you know what, <laughs> what they're trying to Like, that's not right at all. And those are a little bit harder to spot because they're relying, and they're relying on, their, on your ignorance and their own personal skills. But if you want to know, if you're trying to judge someone whether or not it has authority, you are, you're going to have to know for yourself also what the Bible says uh, as a follower, right? So I, you know, I, I'm, going to, I'm not going to go into that anymore because this is more about leading than following. Leading, though, you do need to follow. You need, you need to be able to lead with authority. And in order to do that, you need to know what, what God's Word says. Turn to Titus chapter 2 because Titus was a leader. And again, we see the Apostle Paul writing to Titus. Titus was a spiritual leader. Titus chapter 2, verse number 7, the Bible says, In all things, showing thyself a pattern of good works. So remember, this is, this is going over the same exact thing we were saw. Hey, leading by example. Showing yourself a pattern of good works. In doctrine, showing uncorruptness. In order to be uncorrupt in your doctrine, you have to know what it is. You need, you need to have it all studied already and fleshed out and know what you're talking about in order to teach doctrine that's uncorrupt. Gravity, sincerity. People can spot the sincerity also of, of you, you know, not being a hypocrite, but being sincere about it. Believing what you're teaching. Sound speech that cannot be condemned. 
that he that is of the contrary part may be ashamed, having no evil thing to say of you. And this is extremely important, especially being a leader in the church. Because all leaders probably have people who hate them and want to knock them down a notch, and they're always going to be looking for things. You know, people who, who don't like you. You know, you, 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 you may, especially if you're a good leader, you have a lot of people following you, but there's going to be those other guys, right? The ones that, that want your spot, they're envious of you, or they don't like you, and they're going to be looking for any reason to criticize you and to bring you down and to tarnish your name and to, and to make your credibility go down because they catch you doing something they shouldn't be doing. So we need to make sure that we have, like it says here, sound speech that cannot be condemned. You need to be able to hold yourself up to a high standard in order to maintain this leadership, in order to maintain the integrity, in order to maintain the trust of the people. Because people, you know, when you, when you start leading them, they start trusting you. They're going to put confidence in you that what you're teaching them is true and right. Now, think about all these things and, th and, and try to keep all of these points in mind. We're going to go through them as we go through our applications. You may not be the pastor of a church, ever. But this isn't just for pastors of the church. These are all leadership skills that we can all use in our own lives. I believe everybody can use these to some level to be a leader in one way or another. And then jump down to verse 15 of Titus chapter 2. He says, These things speak and exhort and rebuke with all authority. So Paul's Paul saying, look, you need to be able to do this with all authority. Speak these things, exhort people, hey, lift people up, and also rebuke. Being a leader, he needs to be able to tell the truth by speaking. He needs to be able to exhort people, hey, come on, let's do this job, let's do this work, and, and, and build them up in order to do the work. But as a, as a good leader, you also need to be able to rebuke sometimes when it's necessary to. You can't just let everybody think they're always doing a good job all the time if they're not. It's part of being honest and having integrity and just being able to say the whole thing like it is. And say, well, this is, this is the way it is. You need to be able to rebuke with all authority. Let no man despise thee. A good leader is not afraid to say what needs to be said without apology. You don't need, if you're teaching the truth, if you're teaching God's word, you don't need to apologize for it. There is no apology. Just because people don't like it, you don't need to apologize for it. I don't apologize for God's word when I teach. And we have, a, you know, and this has come up multiple times in the church because it comes up probably multiple times in every church. It's not always handled the right way. But we have so many people these days that are divorced. It's a big problem in this country. So many people are divorced. But I'll tell you what, I'm not going to apologize when Jesus Christ said that once you're divorced, you, you can't get remarried. That he says, you know, whosoever um, causes, you know, put, a, um, put his wife away, causeth her to commit adultery. I'm not going to apologize for those verses. I'm not going to say, oh, I'm sorry. No, no, that's what God's word says. Now, I'm not going to be mean about it, try, you know, telling people what God's word says. I'll be tactful, but I'm not going to apologize for it. It's not something I'm sorry that God wrote. I'm not sorry that God wrote it because God's word is pure and true and I'm going to stand on it and stand firm and, and wholeheartedly embrace it and accept it. And I'm going to teach it. I'm not going to withhold something like that because, oh, because this person's divorced and they're not going to want to hear that. No, they need to hear that. And you know what? That might cause some people to leave because they don't like what they're hearing. But overall, as a leader... It's going to give you credibility because people will see that and say, you know what? He's not afraid to say what God's word says. He's going to stick by it, even if that means someone might leave. Even if that means someone might get upset, sticking to the truth and sticking to God's word and being able to uh, speak, exhort, and rebuke with all authority. The authority is in the Bible. My last point here. The last principle of, of being a leader, before we get into the applications, turn if you would to 2 Timothy chapter 2. You're in Titus. Just flip back like a page to 2 Timothy chapter 2. Is to be meek, be humble. It's true. You need to have confidence and be able to lead with authority. 
You can do so in a way that doesn't lift you up to the point to where you're arrogant. And, and you treat people poorly because you're thinking so highly of yourself. And thinking so lowly of other people. The best leader, hear me now, the best leader is going to be a minister to other people. A servant. The best leaders are servants to, to the people you're leading. Now, look at what it says in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 24. The Bible reads, And the servant of the Lord must not strive, but be gentle unto all men, apt to teach, patient, in meekness, instructing those that oppose themselves. If God, peradventure, will give them repentance to the acknowledging of the truth, and that they may recover themselves out of the snare of the devil who are taken captive by him at his will. There's a lot of people out there, you know, you're saying, look, you don't need to fight and strive with people you know, disputing over the law and all this other stuff. You don't need to be getting into these debates and arguments with people. You don't need to strive, but what you do is you instruct those people because usually they're, what they're doing is they're opposing themselves. You get false doctrine and these false beliefs. There's a contradiction in there. They're opposing themselves. They're opposing the Word of God, whatever. And we need to be able to, with meekness, instruct those people. Just be able to say, hey, this is what, you know, instruct them. This is what the Bible says is right. You don't need to get angry about it and, get, and, and start fighting about it. You can instruct with meekness. And, you know, meekness isn't to be, you know, the opposite of meekness would be saying, well, you need to listen to me because, you know, I've been studying the Bible for 30 years. I've been saved for this long. I've gone to college. I've got my degree. So you just need to listen to me. That's not instructing people with meekness. Instructing people with meekness is saying, you know what, you know, I, I didn't write this, but this is what the Bible says. You know, the, look, at what, look at what God's Word says right here. Look at what God's Word says here. Not my Word. You know, I don't, I don't, have, I don't have a dog in this race, so to speak. I don't, I don't have my own words that are competing with God's Word. I don't have my own opinions that, are, that I just want to exalt more than what the Bible says. We just need to try to teach in meekness and instruct in meekness and be able to, to be a teacher that, uh, or a leader that cannot be puffed up, but rather can, can have charity and edify. The Bible says, knowledge puffeth up, but charity edifieth. So we need to be able to balance all these things to be a good leader. Let's look at some applications now. I mentioned soul winning, right? In soul winning, you're leading somebody to Christ. So I'm going to go through these points that, that I just went through and how we can apply that to our soul winning. So the first point, the first principle I mentioned for being a good leader is lead by example. Um, with soul winning, you're leading someone to Christ. You're already saved. I mean, you already believe this. So you're kind of making that evident. There's, there's not as much of an example there because what you're doing is you're teaching them to believe. Now, one of the ways you could lead by example, though, is to share your own personal testimony of how you came to believe on Jesus Christ. It's always, it, could, it can very oftentimes be helpful for somebody to hear that, right? It's a good way to, in that sense, lead by example is to be able to share, hey, you know, maybe you share something in common with the person you're talking to and you could, you could say, I was doing the same exact thing, but here's what I did. Here's what, you know, this is how I came to this conclusion. And, and you know, that way you can kind of lead by example in that sense. But um, also without hypocrisy. So, as I mentioned earlier, you know, no one's going to want to listen to you talk about God when you live a life that indicates you really don't care what he says. If you want to be a good soul winner. Now, I believe everybody, as soon as you get saved, ought to start witnessing to people. Ought to start preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. I don't think that you have to get to a certain level before you can start preaching Jesus. And I encourage everybody to get started. But if you want to be more effective, again, we're talking about principles here to make you a better leader. If you want to be a better soul winner, if you want to lead people to Christ in a better way, 
then let's do so in a manner where you're leading by example without hypocrisy. So even just your outward appearance, because that's mostly what they're going to know about you because they don't really know you. You go up to a random person, you preach them the gospel, they don't know who you are. They don't know all of the things that you do in your life, but the way that you present yourself to them is going to tell them a lot. They may or may not have a knowledge of the Bible, but let's say they do, and you're a man, and you come to them, and you've got this really long hair, right? And they know, wait a minute, 1 Corinthians 11 says, you know, it's a shame for a man to have long hair. Maybe they know that. Maybe they're in another false religion, and then they see you, oh, you believe in Jesus, yet you're coming to me with this, you know, looking like that? That shows you, you can't even understand that the, that the Bible says it's a shame for a man to have long hair. You know, just one example. There, there's not many, but just your outward appearance, the way that you're going to present yourself, the way that you're going to be an ambassador for Jesus Christ. If you want to lead someone to the Lord, why don't you do so in a way where they're going to take you seriously? And as I mentioned earlier, you know, one of the principles also is having confidence and authority. The way that you're dressed, whether it's right or wrong, is going to make an impact on how people view you. When I'm dressed in a suit and I talk to people, I'm dealt with much differently than when I'm in a t-shirt and jeans. Whether I'm pastoring or not, just in any aspect of my life, when I go out and interact with people, the way that I'm treated when I'm wearing a suit or wearing nice clothing, I'm not saying you have to wear a suit to go soul winning. Okay, get the point of what I'm trying to say here. When you go out and you're dressed nice or professional looking, people will listen to you as if you even have more authority, whether you even have it or not. Because that's how people are. And if you want to be successful in this area, I, I firmly believe that you ought to be dressed in a way that's going to get people to listen, to want to listen to you. Or at least give you some respect. But having confidence and authority... Why should a person at the door believe what you're telling them if you are not confident? Or maybe if you're, you're afraid, you, you know, you, you, you're not very bold and you're, you're kind of, you know, and, and look, we all go through this. I've gone through this too. It could be nerve wracking and I'm not, I'm not trying to tear you down for doing this. Again, the point is to help you become a better soul winner. Maybe you're not having very much success. These are all things that can help you to lead someone to Christ better. And uh, some of these things, you, you know, you're only going to gain them by experience. You know, you're going to build your confidence by doing. One way, of course, is by studying the Bible. We all ought to have that knowledge, and that's something you can do every day. You should be doing every day to gain that knowledge to build your confidence. Pray for the boldness. But ultimately, by doing is going to give you the most experience to give you the confidence to continue to go out and become a better soul winner. And it'll, it, you'll, you'll be... You'll, fill that role much better of, of being able to understand the authority and, the, and, and building the confidence. The more you talk to people, it, it will happen. But we also, when you, when you preach the gospel, you're trying to lead someone to Christ, don't be ashamed of what the Bible says. You might have someone that might try to back you in a corner and say, oh, well, you believe, you know, do you believe this? and try to make a mock out of it and try to make you feel bad for believing something, right? Again, the authority comes from God's word. Don't let them back you down. If you're, if you're going to be a leader, because then what's going to happen is when you start backing down, they're the leader. If you want to lead someone else to Christ, don't let them become the leader and start teaching you and telling you why, you're, you know, what, why this is bad and, and mocking you and, and you know, that you're not going to be successful. Let's put it that way. You know, if, you're, if they're going to start doing that and you, and you, don't, you can't counteract that, then just go and find someone else to talk to. Because if you're going to lead someone to Christ, you need to lead them to Christ. You can't let them be leading you around. The Bible says in Romans 1.16, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God and the salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also the Greek. I'm not ashamed of, God's, of the gospel of Christ at all. And you ought not to be either. And oftentimes people get scared and don't want to give the gospel to someone. And that's a shame. It's a shame when you, when you get scared and you don't want to bring up the fact that you believe in Jesus Christ. Are you ashamed of Jesus? Are you ashamed of the gift that he gave to you? I hope not. 
it's something that's so magnificent and amazing that we should want to spread it to the whole world. I mean, tell everybody about this. This is good news. This is great news. You can have eternal life and it's free. It's just a gift. Take the gift. Be excited about it. I know the world hates Jesus Christ, but don't let that make you ashamed of him because of this wicked world. 1 Peter 3.15 says, But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear, having a good conscience that whereas they speak evil of you as of evildoers, they may be ashamed that falsely accuse your good conversation in Christ. To be a successful soul winner, to be a leader, to lead somebody to Christ, we ought to be ready to give an answer to every man that asks a question why you have that, the hope inside of you. And that's going to come through study and knowing the Bible. And that will help you to become a better leader leading people to Christ. Now, we also want to make sure, because the last thing I had in here was, was the meekness, the, the principle of soul winning, or principle of being a leader. Don't get this holier-than-thou attitude, right? Because that would be the puffed-up attitude. When, you, when we go out and preach the gospel of Jesus Christ, we need to be humble and meek. And... I've seen this happen too. Sometimes in, you know, people get fired up in church. They, 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 they have a great zeal. They start purging sins out of their lives and, and really growing. And they get involved with sowing and stuff. And then it, in some people, it can, it can turn into a haughty, holier-than-thou attitude where you start looking down at people, even new believers. And it's like, oh, you're doing this and that and this. Oh, you're doing that. Look, don't treat people that way. When you have a brother in Christ and they commit a, a, a terrible sin and you need to separate from them, then separate from them. But you don't need to have a holier-than-thou attitude about how wicked these people are and everything else. You know, basically, the, the false way of leading people to Christ, like the way of the master, the Ray Comfort way, has this type of an attitude. And they just try to, 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 to br just berate people on how horrible of a person that they are. You don't need to do that. They're going to look at you and be like, well, who are you? You're a sinner too. You know, like, it's important for people to understand that they're a sinner and that, and that there's a consequence of hell. Of course, you have to know that. You have to know that you need a Savior in order to get saved. There has to be a need for a Savior. Otherwise, why would you need one? Why would, you, why, would, why would you put your faith on Christ if you didn't need a Savior? You need to understand that, but you don't have to do that in a way where you're, where you're just taking this position where you're righteous and they're ungodly and they're, and they're just this wicked heathen and have a holier-than-thou attitude. So we need to be humble when we give the gospel. Now, next application, soul winning when you're teaching another soul winner. So we just went through leading someone else to Christ. How about when you're teaching someone else to, be, to lead someone to Christ? Obviously, you need to lead by example and without hypocrisy. Again, for, for, for plain reasons, you're going to be showing them how, to, how to, to go soul winning. So if you're telling someone, hey, this is how you give the gospel, and then you just do it like a completely different way like every other time, that's not a very good leading by example. But um, I understand there's not just one way to give the gospel. But when you're training someone and teaching somebody, Try to be consistent and lead by example. Um, and without hypocrisy. Now, confidence and authority. Having the confidence and authority when you're, when you're showing someone else how to do it can come by experience um, when teaching others. It's similar to soul winning, uh, just leading someone else to Christ. Doing it is going to give you more of the confidence and more of the authority when, you, when you're teaching more people how to do it. But the last one I want to focus on is, is having meekness. Because we all have things to improve in our own soul winning, myself included. I am always looking to do a better job. Always. I don't claim to be God's gift to soul winning, right? That God made me this soul winning master and that you just all need to follow me. Look, no. Now, there's a lot of things I've, I've learned along the way and I have a lot of experience doing this and... and am successful, but it's not, it's, it's not my own power, but a lot of it comes from experience. It's not, um, there's, but there's not only one right way of doing it. 
So like my way isn't the only way to go. So, and that's why I love to go when people come into town, whether it be an evangelist or, you know, a, um, visitors or anyone, anyone who does soul winning, I love going out soul winning with them because I want to see what they do. I want to see the, the, the way that they explain things. I want to hear the, the references that they use and the explanations they give because I want to become better, right? So when we're teaching other people, now you're being a teacher, you know, they're just learning, so they're not going to have those things for you to gain, but if you have that mentality of understanding that your way isn't just the only way to do it, right? And once maybe they start talking, not railing on it, well, you didn't do it the right way. Well, hold on a second. You know, let them, give them some grace and let them learn. What we don't want to do is when someone's learning how to get soul, how to soul in, is to turn them away from doing it all together. So the last thing you want to do is to turn your soul winning partner away from ever wanting to go soul winning because of the way that you're leading them and instructing them. So it's important when you instruct to have meekness. There's teachers that I've had where you don't ever want to have that teacher again. Why? Because they talk to you like you're an idiot. Right? If you, like, like in a math, class, a math class where we had this teacher and no one in the class could understand what in the world are you talking about? No one could understand the way that he was trying to teach us. Nobody. I mean, like literally the whole class was just like failing. And because he was failing as a, as a teacher, as the leader of the class, and what do you, he would treat everyone like, I don't understand why you guys are going to get this. This is easy. And he's telling us this is easy and nobody's understanding it. Right? That's not being very meek and humble and trying to get us to, to understand things and breaking it down simple. And when you want to, to when you're going to lead someone in soul winning, hey, don't be overcritical, especially when they start to talk and when they start to do things. You know, they need to learn. Remember that where you were when you started. I remember what I was, and I was dropping my Bible on the ground. <laughs> and you know, if I had done that the first time I opened up my mouth to somebody, and the sewing partner I was with that was instructing me and, and, and helped leading me was just like, oh man, I can't believe you did that. You're such an idiot. I wouldn't want to go out soul winning again after that. I would not want to do it. I would be, I, I mean, it would just be like, I'm a failure, right? And that wouldn't be very meek and humble them to do that. You know, because there's, you know, there's certain areas that doesn't require a rebuke anyways. You know, when someone's out soul winning and they have the heart and they want to teach, hey, they're doing the right thing. They want to do what's right. If they don't always do the right, you know, do it exactly the right way, we need to have the humility and the humbleness to be able to, to be long-suffering, right? And be careful not to discourage the person learning. Now, I'll be honest, this has a tendency to happen more often with people who know each other well than with straight, you know. So, like, when I went out soul winning and Pastor Anderson was my teacher, we're not going to have that same, you know, because we're, we're like more distant, right? We're more like strangers, we're, you know, we're friends, but not like close. But if you go out with like a sibling, like a, like a brother or a sister or a family member, you know, like someone else, you have a tendency to be more, you're a spouse, you have a tendency to be more critical of them. And you might, be, you might have a tendency to talk harsher to those people because you're so comfortable with each other, because, you know, um, it, so be careful of that, right? Be careful that, that you don't get overly critical over someone just because you're comfortable with them. Think about them in a way where they can be just like, just like any other random new believer. Say, think about them like your convert that you want to get out soul winning and treat them the same way of how much you want them to learn and to grow and to, and to, and to lead souls to Christ and, and, and take them with that type of an attitude. Well, let's move on. I got, we're running out of time here. My last uh, application here is going to be in the family with husbands and mothers. And I combine them into one. So we'll kind of go through both of them. But the husband obviously has a job of leading your wife and your children, leading your whole family. That is one role that you have. And I'm not going to get into all the various roles that men and women have within a marriage and within a family. But the leadership role, husbands have it over the whole family, but mothers also have it over children. In the family, mothers still have a leadership role with their children because they spend all day with them while the husband's off working, the mother's at home teaching the children. Now, it's extremely important. I said before, lead by example. As a parent, you are leading your children 
You need to lead by example. They, will, they look and watch the things that you do more than the things that you say. The things that you do are what they're going to pick up on more than what you say. So if you expect your family to go to church or to read their Bible and you're not doing it, you're going to be a hypocrite and your family's going to see that and they're going to say, well, you're saying it's real important, then why aren't you there? Why aren't you doing this? You say I need to read my Bible. Why aren't you reading your Bible every day? They'll see these things and they're going to learn a lot more from your actions than from what you're telling them to do. And if you're the husband, if you're the father, you should be doing the most. If you, it, it, because you're supposed to be the spiritual leader of the family. The man is supposed to be the spiritual leader. The Bible says in um, 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 34, the Bible says, Let your women keep silence in the churches, for it is not permitted unto them to speak, but they are commanded to be under obedience, as also saith the law. And if they will learn anything, let them ask their husbands at home, for it is a shame for women to speak in the church. You say, look, this is the role that God's given unto women. You say, they can't speak in the church. They can't ask questions. They, if they're going to learn anything, they need to go and ask their husbands at home. And if they're, gonna, if they're required and expected to ask their husbands at home, husbands, have an answer for them. They're relying on you to be able to go to in order to learn something that they hear at church, to be able to learn something they've heard from the Word of God. If they have a question, they need to be able to go to you. So if they're going to be coming to you, you need to expect this which means you need to be ahead of them with your Bible reading, with your Bible understanding to be able to answer those questions. That's your job. And as a leader, you need to have that type of an understanding. But leading by example, leading without hypocrisy, you know, do you tell your children TV's bad, don't ever watch TV, and then you're over there watching TV? Again, I mean, it's, it's the same type of thing. They're going to see that and say, wait a minute. You know, this isn't adding up. Why should I have to do this if he's not doing it? Leading your family with confidence and authority. God has put you in this role of great importance regardless of what today's culture might have you think. Whether you're a man or a woman. Right now, I was just talking about this yesterday with someone in church. Husbands have an extremely important role of leading the family and providing. Providing for working hard for the family. That is the role. And you can have the confidence and authority with this role from the Bible. And that's what your know, husbands and wives in your family. Your roles, you can have the confidence and authority to fulfill your own specific leadership role based on God's word. You know, the Bible says that if a man will not provide for, for them of his own household, he's worse than an infidel. Okay, that's the authority there to work hard and provide for your family, men. Now, a wife's role is, is raising children, right? And make it keeping the home. Be a keeper at home and, and, and doing those things well. And um, obviously, a leader, a wife isn't going to be a leader without other people to lead. So the wife, if it's just a husband and wife and there's no children... The wife isn't a leader. You can be a leader in the sense of, you know, other people that, of influence that you have, maybe family members, other family members, or, or, you know, other women at church. But you're not going to be a leader in that household unless there's children. But the husband are going to have a leadership role whether there's children or not. Because the husband is always going to have to lead his wife. The Bible says in Ephesians 5.22, Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he is the Savior of the body. So we have the biblical authority. Husbands have the biblical authority, regardless of what the culture says, to be the head of the family, the head of the household. But Christ, obviously, is the ultimate head. So the, the husband, you need to submit yourself under the authority of Christ. But the wife needs to submit herself to the authority of the husband. Now, as you lead and as you teach, leading by example, leading without hypocrisy, having the confidence and authority to do your job and to fill your role, 
We need to do so again with meekness and long suffering, whether the husband or the wife, with the wife with the children, or the husband with the wife and the children. The Bible says in Colossians 3, verse 21, Fathers, provoke not your children to anger, lest they be discouraged. You need to be able, as a father, to teach your children, to, to train your child. And, you know, whether it's, you know, disciplining, whatever they need, you need to be able to do so in a way where you're not provoking them to anger. Right? You don't need to be overly harsh with them. You know, you give them what's appropriate and what, what they need. But you don't want your children to become angry with you. Now, you can't always control their emotions. But there are ways... And you know this is true. There are ways, because you are so much smarter and, and, and wiser than, than, a, than a young child, where you could manipulate them if you wanted to and provoke them to anger and mess with them and do things to just get them angry just because you're in the position to do so. And the Bible says you don't want to do that. Don't provoke your children to anger lest they be discouraged. You don't want your child to become discouraged from following your lead and just break them down to the point to where they're just broken and discouraged and see no reason. You know, when you're leading them, ultimately you're going to, hopefully, you're going to want them to be like you and better. Right? To follow your example. As Apostle Paul was saying to the church of Thessalonica, hey, follow us. You have us an example. Or follow me as I follow Christ. You should be able to say that to your son or to your daughter. Hey, follow me as I follow Christ. I'm going to be your example. You don't want them discouraged from following you. You, know, you don't want them saying, well, if this is what following you is all about. I don't want to have anything to do with it because this is just nothing but, but, but painful and whatever. You know, like, like there's nothing good out of this. We don't want to provoke our children to wrath. And, you know, as a, as a woman, if you have children, you want them, whether they're sons or daughters, first of all, they need to be able to respect you and, um, and your position because you're leading them. But uh, if, you're, if you're a woman with daughters, you know, you want to give them the proper example of, a, of the way a godly wife should be and behave and, and teach them by example. And men, if you have sons, teach them the way a godly man should be and lead them by example. So hopefully you'll be able to put these principles into use. You know, everybody has an opportunity to be a leader one way or another. We need to strive to be the best leaders that we can by leading by example, without any hypocrisy, by doing what we say and saying what we do. We need to be able to lead with the confidence and authority that's given to us from God's Word. This is where the authority lies. And, and realizing and knowing that that's to be true, to, to help us to be more confident in the things that we preach and teach and say. And then, finally, to be able to do so with humility and in meekness so that we don't come off as proud and arrogant and haughty and better than everyone else. Because the whole point of leading is, you know, hopefully you're trying to lead people to a better place, to do better things, to do more things, to serve God, to, 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 to help them to grow. I mean, the whole leader is that there's a goal. There's a purpose, right? When you're leading people, you have a purpose in mind. And that purpose should be for something better than yourself. The purpose shouldn't just be for you. The purpose is for something else. The purpose is to serve God. And ultimately, that's going to be helping them. So we need to help them along the way and have that spirit of leadership, that spirit of, of meekness and serving. Jesus Christ was a great leader. And when he came, he was a servant. He led by example. When he went and washed the disciples' feet, he said, I'm showing you. And he told them, you want to be great? Do you want to be greatest in the kingdom of heaven? You're going to be least here. You're going to be servant of all. You want, to, you want to be ruler of everyone? You need to become a servant. That's how you're going to learn how to be the great leader. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for these great principles in the Bible. Lord, I pray that you please help us all to implement these into our life. I know it's a, it's a daily... Um, task for us to try to improve. Lord, help us to become better soul winners. Help us to teach others to, to learn soul winning. Help us to um, lead our families, lead our children, dear God. And um, Lord, I pray that you would please give us the knowledge that we need. Give us the confidence. Give us the boldness. 
Lord, I pray that as we go out sowing this afternoon, that you'd give us the boldness that we need to preach the gospel and the desire in our heart to serve you, dear Lord, and help us to be um, good examples unto others. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.